on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Metro Ford of OKC. ESPN's Dan Orlovsky joins us to preview Super Bowl 55. Dan breaks down the Bucks chiefs matchup from every angle, and we talk NFL QBs, including Baker, Kyler, Deshaun, and Stafford. We'll bring you the latest OU football updates, including Buki entering the transfer portal in the National College Football Roundup. We bring you the latest college football news, including EA Sports bringing back the college football video game. Let's go. We give you our winners and losers of the week, and we wet the beak with some Super Bowl 55 prop bets. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. My man, Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Thursday, February 4th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Metro Ford of OKC. Metro Ford of OKC's inventory is the best of the best. In fact, they own more Black Widows and more 2021 F-150s than anybody else. They're the only Roush and Rocky Ridge dealer in the state. You can find a ride at Metro Ford of OKC that you can't find anywhere else in Oklahoma. Just like their selection of vehicles is unmatched, so is their customer service. The Metro Ford of OKC difference program is included with the purchase of every new and pre-owned vehicle. It includes free oil changes for life, lifetime window tint, lifetime nitrogen fill for your tires, complimentary wheel locks, interior fabric protection, complimentary service loaners, a complimentary shuttle with service, and a complimentary multi-point inspection. Come feel the performance when you test drive a Roush or Raptor and come see why the difference is real at Metro Ford of OKC. Visit MetroFordofOKC.com for more information or go to the dealership and tell them we sent you. Now we're recording this on Wednesday night. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review and let us know you, you want us to try to get on the podcast. We've got Dan Orlovsky to preview Super Bowl 55 but more importantly, Teddy, we've uh, we've got some things we've got to take care of real quick off the top. You celebrated an anniversary this week, sir. That's right. I mean, 13 years. Can you believe someone what? has put up with me for 13 years, Gabe? Unbelievable. I okay. I'm and I'm not just going to tell you this story because you're my friend and you're my podcast partner and I want you to feel good. And I want you to be good on this episode. We were looking at the pictures. We were going through your wife's Instagram because she posted about the anniversary and my wife is looking at him. We're in bed. We're looking at it. And she goes, you know what? I think Teddy's better looking bald. <laughs> and yeah. And I was like, what'd you say? She was like, I, I really think he's more attractive with like the shaved head. And I looked at her and I was like, I cannot wait to tell him that that's going to make his day. I'm telling you bald is beautiful. And it's a trend Gabe that is sweeping the nation. Look out. I, I can see you. I, 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 there's a little jealousy there. I could see you maybe trying it out real quick. I don't, you would need like a chainsaw to get through that thick rug though. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to lose my hair. I got a lot of gray, but I don't think I'm going to lose it. But maybe one of these days. Hey, if you were going to lose it, you'd know by now. I started true. seeing hair in my helmet at like 17 in high school. Okay, so. Oh, I bet that was depressing. Now, I, I, I do need to uh, get, talk about something real quick before we move on. It is my wife's birthday. So happy birthday, honey. You are the most kind loving spectacular woman ever and life with you is so much fun i love you okay uh, so you now we're starting out man. now, You've got now that we've taken out. care of what we need to take <laughs> care of well, we'll move on and we'll start talking about the ou stuff and that's brought to you by first fidelity bank first fidelity bank is a full service financial institution based in oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community 
FFB donates a total of more. Hey, that wasn't right. FFB donates a total of more than five hundred thousand dollars to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. So with the OU stuff, let, let's start with Buki Radley Hiles entering the transfer portal. He is one of the most criticized players for OU in recent memory. Now, that has to do with some of the mistakes he made on the field. Uh, but I also think that criticism kind of got compounded because he was a five-star guy that was supposed to be a huge difference maker on the field for Oklahoma. And he just was never that guy. He, he never turned into that guy. Was a decent player. Uh, was never like an all-conference player. But did some good things. Had some really bad moments. Uh, made some bad mistakes on the field. But I, I will say this about Buki. His play wasn't at the level that he was hoping for or that OU was hoping for, but he was exactly what they wanted in every other way. He, he was a great locker room guy. He was a good leader. He was good with the media. I mean, I always really enjoyed talking to him after games. Like He was great on the mic, but he was really helpful in recruiting as well. But it, it just never worked out on the field. Ted and I, I wasn't surprised to see him enter the portal, but uh, I think it says a lot about him, what he was as a teammate that you saw all of those other players posting about him. You know, I think Creed Humphrey came out and even said he, he helped develop the culture in that locker room. I mean, Lincoln Riley comes out and says that he certainly hopes his career isn't over at Oklahoma and they'll see how it all will work out. Uh, so uh, I know it's been easy to criticize Buki, right? And, and I'm not going to pretend like he he played well. I mean, he didn't play well at times. He made some critical errors in games, but I, I think how everyone has responded says a lot about him. I mean, at the end of the day, all you really care about is what do your teammates and coaches feel about you? I mean, that's – Fans are gonna fans are gonna love you one day and hate you the next. I mean that's just kind of the nature of it, and that's what we sign up for. That's fine, but if if your teammates and your coaches respect you, that's that's really all all you care for. You know, I think it was the perfect storm with Buki in a bad way, and it started off. And I don't mean this negatively, but it started off with him being a five star. He should not have been a five star. And it has nothing to do with like his ability or anything. A five star player is a guy that checks every single box. And you're basically saying like he's going to be a pro. He's going to be a first round type of draft pick. He does not have prototypical size. He and, and his size was such an issue that it was going to affect him in everything that he did. So that's why I think he shouldn't have been a five-star. And I don't think it was fair to him that he was given a five-star because he goes in somewhere with higher expectations really than, than he should have. And then once he's here, it was compounded whenever he's a true freshman in like during training camp, we've got coaches saying that he's going to be the next Roy Williams. And the people can't watch practice, but whenever the coaches are saying he's going to be the next Roy Williams, he's a five-star, this guy's going to be unbelievable. So before anyone ever saw him play a snap, they've got this expectation that, you know, we've got one of the best defensive players in the country here. And it didn't matter what happened after that. He was never going to live up to it. Never going to live up to it. So everything was was set up early on for him to to not live up to that expectation. Now, I I think that it Buki saved our tail the last two years. You go back a year before, they wanted Trey Norwood to be the nickel. Okay. Trey Norwood had looked great through the offseason, had looked great to start off off training camp, and then he tears his ACL. Buki steps in and 
ends up having a really good, solid year. And if it wasn't for him, who knows what we would have done at that position. Fast forward the next year. He, he uh, Norwood is out. They, you know, they're, they're young at the position. He's given them stability at the nickel spot a lot. And we overlook a bunch of really good things that he's done because of some negatives. And you have to admit, the negatives were bad. And not only were they bad, the timing could not have been worse. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like some of the penalties and, and some of the things that happened was just the, the LSU timing. targeting is one uh, of I mean, the dumbest penalties I've ever seen. And he's a smart I, football player. It's one just, of the dumbest penalties I've ever seen. And what makes it the most egregious is it already happened to him once that year against TCU, the same exact thing. So, um, there, there, there was a lot of frustration, some of it his fault, most of it, in my opinion, not his fault. But, you know, at the end of the day, whenever his, his teammates are saying what they're saying and you look at, at what he did, like he, he gave us some really good stability in the secondary whenever we were kind of reeling at times, you know, through, through the year before with Norwood going down late. And through this year with COVID and all that stuff, the fact that he was able to give you some good stability there and be counted on to be in the right place, do the right thing, be lined up, which is sounds like the easiest thing in the world is really difficult. A lot of guys never see the field because they don't, they can't ever get lined up properly. He gave you some good stability where you knew you're going to have a guy in the right place. And, you know, he made some good plays, but, you know, he fought his size, his entire career, everything he like, he had no margin for error because he was always, always the smallest guy on the field out of the 22 players out there. Yeah. And I mean, just from, I think some fans perspective, he, he also didn't do himself any favors with the way that he celebrated some of those routine plays and, you know, things like that. That never bothered me. Listen, I, I want every single one of my defensive backs to act like Buki acted. That That's how I want my guys in the secondary. I, I want them confident. I want them loud. I want them to celebrate. Now I want them to make more plays than Buki made. And I want them to be bigger than he was. But I had no problem really with the way he carried himself. And for some reason, that seemed to bother a, a lot of people. Listen, you you have to think you're the best. If you walk around thinking, you know what, I'm I'm kind of shitty. Well, guess what? <laughs> you're you're not going to be any good. So I I don't know why that was so hard for some people to understand. But well, I, I, I mean, I, I would say like you do. You got to be confident. And you're supposed to have fun playing. At the end of the day, no doubt. Like especially on defense. Teams that have fun play well, and it's supposed to be like that, and that's how you create energy. But you do have to read the room a little bit. In a game where you've given up 50 points and you make a tackle for a six-yard gain on second down, that should not be cause for celebration. You know what I'm saying? Self-awareness <laughs> is key. Self-awareness <laughs> is key, you know, recognizing what the moment is. But, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with him and Hey, Lincoln Riley, he he's kept the door open for Buki to return. And hey. I, I don't know what's going to happen. May, I, I assume he'll end up somewhere probably back on the West coast. I wouldn't be surprised if it's in, if it's in the state of California, but there's been rumors of Utah that he was, he was going to transfer to Utah. Um, I don't know where that came from. I got no reason. That's just something that I've heard. Um, I would rather Buki stay than go. I'm and with you. You want depth. I yeah. I don't think he's going to be a starter next year. And I don't think they should promise him any amount of reps at all. But the guy's been a three-year starter. They've tried every way possible to replace him, and they can't find anyone better or more consistent. And we know this. You know, you are a snap away from being down a guy for an entire season. And if you don't have anyone there and ready, it can bite you. And that's where experience really comes in. 
right? And, and that experience is key. Ha having depth, like you said, uh, I think OU's defense will be better without him on the field because it'll get a guy that has more length on the field. But injuries happen, right? It's every single season, right? Injuries happen. This is still football. You want as much depth, especially in the defensive backfield, uh, as possible. Okay, Ted, Wednesday was signing day, and OU had no signings. It, matter of fact, they didn't even send out a national letter of intent on signing day because of how well they did with the transfer portal. So you look at this signing class and you can go back and listen to the episode we did where we kind of recapped the signing class on, on early signing day. But according to the 24 seven sports composite OU's 2021 recruiting class is ranked 11th. That obviously doesn't include the guys they got in the transfer portal, which I think would significantly enhance their ranking. But one interesting thing to note, if, if you look at the recruiting classes by average player ranking, and re remember, or average player rating, I think is the way they put it. Remember, this is a smaller class for OU, but if you look at average player rating, OU actually comes in at fourth behind Bama, Ohio State, and Georgia, I think, when I looked at it. So well, we've talked about this class being quality over quantity, Ted. Yeah. Clemson is higher. Uh, so Clemson would have been ahead. We would have been fifth. We're ahead of LSU, whose who's rating is lower than ours, but they had 22 commits. But, I mean, that – that means exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's quality. And I think they got the right players in the right places. Um, you know, we, we, we got a, a really good edge guy, the number six player in out of Texas, the Clayton Smith kid. We obviously got the five-star quarterback, which, you know, if you want to know why Oklahoma has been as good as they have, and they've won six straight big 12 championships and, uh, been the the model of consistency in this conference it's because of quarterback play so when you lock down the quarterback like that that's what you've got to do first and we've got a good long-term quarterback a five-star kid that looks athletic as heck and and could be a really good guy so I, I mean there looks like there's some really good players in this class so I'm I, I love it plus you know they knew they wanted to hit the transfer portal and you can't just conjure those scholarships up out of thin air. They go towards your numbers. So uh, that gave them plenty of room to be able to have some maneuverability. Yeah, sorry. I'm just an idiot. Clemson. So there, that means he'll use fifth. You're, you're, you may be the numbers guy on this podcast. Well, I talked about that some today on the show. So it had been pre-scouted. But, I mean – it really doesn't matter. It's way better than 11th. They're right up there with the people that we need to be right up there with. Right. And, oh, by the way, I knew this would excite you. I saw this on Twitter. Oh, you did get a commitment from the number one long snapper in the country, Ted. Some kid named Jake, man. I don't know where he's from. I don't care. I think it was like North Carolina or something like that. But I watched one video. The kid can snap the ball to the putter. So, all right. Wow. Well, hey, you know what? You got to lock down that long snapper, I guess. Uh, he better be the real deal. It, can you? What happens if you like burn a scholarship on a long snapper and he never even wins the job? Well, I assume. So what? Uh, what a lot of people may not know is the coaches they can't talk about preferred walk-ons, right? Because technically they're still recruits because walk-ons don't sign anything. Mm -hmm. And they can go wherever they want to go. So I, I'm assuming since this kid said he's committed that yeah. he's not going to be on scholarship or at least not yet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, even better because hey, you know what, let's get this, get the special teams a uh, uh, good because no one even knows or cares who the deep snapper is until they fire one over the punter's head in a tight game. Right. There's no doubt out of sight, out of mind. I never want to hear about the deep snapper. Okay, Lincoln Riley, 
said in his signing day press conference where they didn't sign anyone, he said they are expecting a normal spring ball. We, we've been talking about that a lot already, but it sounds like practice is going to start in late March with a spring game being played in late April. And some people may wonder why, okay, why late April instead of maybe mid April? Well, the NCAA dead period is extended to April 15th. So uh, I think you're going to see teams across the country go with this same schedule because clearly teams are going to want to try to bring recruits in for their spring games. It's become a huge recruiting event. So I, I think Lincoln Riley, along with coaches across the country, are hoping that that dead period doesn't get extended again. So that's why they're going to stick those spring games in late April to hopefully be able to have some kids show up and take in the campus, watch the game. I, I, I don't know. We'll see how it works out. I got to tell you, if I'm a college football coach, and especially the fact that OU signed as good as class as they did with the average signee being up there and they're right on par with the teams they need to be, I'm hoping the dead period gets extended forever to where I never have to go out on the road to recruit again. I mean, this year, I know it's been a sucky year, but at least coaches haven't been traveling all over the country. So that's the one thing. But I do think that, I mean, you want to talk about competitive, like trying to get kids on campus when that dead period ends, my God, it's going to be a race you're going to have some people playing like spring games in the middle of the week. <laughs> like, Hey, come to our Wednesday night spring game. Right. <laughs> There's going to be, be a spring game every day for like 40 days. Yeah. All right. All right. One last, OU thing, uh, and that's that Dennis Simmons has added assistant head coach and passing game coordinator to his job title. Shocker. He stayed with Lincoln Riley and didn't go to Texas. It's almost like, these two guys are incredibly close and love working together. But I will say this, when you do get interest from other schools, and I don't think it's any secret that some other schools were talking to Dennis Simmons, that's how you get a few more titles next to your name. And I assume a little bump in pay. So congrats to Dennis Simmons. He's done, he's done a great job. You, you look at the string of outside wide receivers, uh, D.D. Westbrook, C.D. Lamb, uh, Hollywood, you got what he did with Mims this year. He's been very, very good. Is it me or does every coach on the staff seem like they're also an assistant head coach in their title? Isn't there a lot of that? There's like an associate head coach. There's an assistant head coach. I mean, there's a whole lot of that going on on the staff. Wh which I mean. is which is higher on the totem pole, associate or assistant? Associate sounds... Like at a law firm, an associate's important, right? I mean, it is important, but I mean, if you're if you're actually assisting, maybe that's more important. I have no idea, but I feel like there's like a a, a long list of guys because I feel it Beanbo, and I think even Joe John Finley has something like that in his title. Huh? I don't know. I don't, well, that doesn't mean anything. I was excited for nothing. my man, Dennis Simmons. It's Dennis just Simmons, a way so to, to add a pay bump to you. To you. I mean, you, probably zero more responsibilities other than maybe a, a 15 second chat about strategy before they take the field. But I mean, it's just a pay bump thing, right? Either way, congrats. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> All right, Ted, let's move on to call your shot. And that's brought to you by rock and roll tequila. Rock and roll tequila is the ultra premium tequila that hits all the right notes. It's won all kinds of awards for its superior taste and smooth finish. To find a store that has it, visit rockandrolltequila.com or check out their Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. This stuff is good. If you don't want to take my word for it, maybe you'll listen to this guy. This is Coach Bob Stoops. When you're a college football coach, it's important to have an eye for talent. The same holds true when choosing your tequila. When I tried rock and roll, I liked it so much, I decided to become a partner in this Oklahoma-owned company. 
Crafted in the highlands of Jalisco, Mexico, the smooth taste of rock and roll's triple distilled platinum, our Añejo, called Cristalino, and the incredible premium quality mango tequila are awesome. Our defiantly unique guitar-shaped bottles make it easy to find, and you'll love the ultra-premium quality and taste. No excuses. Make rock and roll your game day tequila. Tastefully rebellious, start the party with rock and roll. And we asked you, what was the most important thing that happened in the last few days for OU football? And our favorite comes from Corey Peterson, at Corey Brand on Twitter, says, Wheaton not signing with us. Not because it's a huge miss, but because the drama is over. Yes, Ted, the uh, the mystery that, w- that surrounded Kamar Wheaton's recruitment finally ended on Wednesday morning when he he signed on the dotted line to go to Alabama. And there there were the rumors that maybe he was having second thoughts, that maybe he was thinking about signing with OU, but he, he ends up joining the Crimson Tide. And it seems like some people around the program are a little relieved and pretty glad that that saga is over. Yeah, I mean, it was a really w- weird deal and uh, I don't know, I don't know anything about the kid. I've only known that it, what people have said and that's been a, a, a really strange recruitment process and there's been some going back and forth and he's been incredibly difficult to get a hold of. But, you know, I I honestly don't know. I don't know what the reason is about that. So, I don't know. The only thing I can say is there's a lot of people with that exact sentiment and I, that's good. I agree, but that I don't want to hear any bitching or complaining. If we play against Alabama in a playoff game and he goes for like two bills. Okay. I don't want to hear anything about how we couldn't get him here. We didn't, we, we weren't able to seal the deal. This guy was a drama queen. Now he's amazing. Right. I don't want to hear anyone complaining whenever right now everyone's saying, well, oh God, good riddance. We didn't want him anyways. I, I would like to just warn OU fans that while this kid's recruitment may have been a little odd, he is going to be an absolute stud at Alabama, right? That's, that, that's just what they do. It, it's guy. Well, how could you after not guy. be with, with the, the offensive lines that they put together? Exactly. He's, he, he He's going to be in the running for the Doak Walker award at some point. Like he's going to play running back at Alabama. That's just what they do. So don't be that upset. Hopefully OU finds a couple guys better than him. Uh, They need to start searching. I will say this. I I was listening to our buddies over at Sooner Scoop and Josh McQuishan, who covers recruiting super closely he, he was like, I've never seen a recruiting saga like this, kids. Like, this is the weirdest thing ever. Like, I've never experienced anything like it. So when you have the guys that are super hardcore into recruiting, like those guys are saying stuff like that, it must have just been weird. Yeah, the, I mean, I'm sure they've got a million crazy stories about uh, recruitments. And if they're saying that about this kid, I mean – it did seem like there's some red flags, but I I don't know the kid. I don't know his reasoning for, for, you know, what went on and how it unfolded, but we'll see what kind of player he turns out to be. We'll know real quick. I mean, if you're quirky and weird and don't fit in, Alabama is not going to be the place to go. You'll, you will be miserable there. Yeah. Uh, the, the NFL factory may not be for you. You got to put, You got to put everything in. There's a certain buy-in that comes in that comes with playing at that program. Okay, let let's get into our interview with Dan Orlovsky. Really fun interview with Dan. He actually did it on his way to the airport, and he was I don't know if he had a driver, if he was an Uber or what, but he had a mask on. But it, it sounds it honestly sounds pretty good. No, I I thought it was great. I thought it was uh I thought it was good, insightful. You know, he's he's as good as there is right out there right now because he does his homework. You can tell he does his homework. Oh, my and, gosh. And it pays with the information that he gives. Yeah, and this interview is brought to you by Insurica. Do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. 
Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best-in-class, connect with Insurica at insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. Okay, here he is. Here's Dan Orlovsky. It is our pleasure to be joined by a man that was a 12-year veteran in the National Football League, and now he is widely considered the rising star in sports media. You can catch him on NFL Live or on one of the other, I don't know, 47 shows he does for ESPN. (laughs) He also has some of the softest yet rugged hands a center could ever ask for. (laughs) Dan Orlovsky Mm. is in the house. Dan, what's up, man? Well, that's a great introduction. I can also share the sentiment that you have with my hands and maybe your butt cheeks. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I just did. Um, What's going on? It's great to be with you, boys. I'm excited to talk some football. I'm just glad... Dan, that you're you're better at the TV stuff and the radio stuff than you than you were at bowling because your bowling game, I got to tell you, struggling pretty bad. Yeah, Teddy. Just so you know, when you first started that comment, I was like, "Wow, the first thing he's going to say is I'm better on television than I was as a player." Uh, so thank you for like not taking that shot right away. Yeah, I was awful at bowling. I never cared to be good though, which was odd for my personality. <laughs> Yeah, you, now you are a great golfer. So you've got golf. Maybe bowling's not your thing. Maybe you got two, you know, God, long if I could pick one of those bowling. two to be good at, it's definitely golf, no not bowling. No All right, Dan. Now we've got you on to obviously talk about the Super Bowl. We'll get to some of the other NFL stuff at the end here. Uh, I want to hear you talk about what happened there with Matthew Stafford and that trade. But let, let let's just start with Patrick Mahomes because clearly probably the best player in football right now, uh, certainly considered the face of the league or headed that way right now. Is it possible for Tampa Bay to slow down that Kansas city offense with the way that he is playing? Like how can you even slow them down with the, with the connection he's developed with Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey? What would you do if you were Todd Bowles? Yeah, I, I wouldn't play man and I wouldn't play zone. Right, that sounds odd for for someone to say. Like, what, what do you mean, Dan? Those are the only two options. Um, but there's a defense that you can kind of play that Tampa play does play a lot of. It's called like match, where you you you. It's it's very. The beginning thoughts are zone defense, right? Everyone's got an area, and then once someone comes to that area, that's your guy until he leaves your area and you start to pass him off. Now it takes incredible communication. You got to be incredibly dialed into like what are the potential concepts out of certain formations. But you don't want to play man because you're not good enough. Really, no one is to just line up and play man against those weapons. You don't want to play zone because you'll just get gutted. But that match defense, and Teddy will know a bunch about it, is it allows you to be physical. It allows you to take away some of the easy throws. You can cover sideline to sideline really well. It also forces, you know, the offense to try and get four or five guys out because you got to find the matchup that you love to win, running away from somebody, and it. And that you guys know, like that keeps five guys in protection, you know, six at the max. And so that allows that really subpar offensive line for Kansas City to be potentially exposed. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing for me about that, I, I like that you bring that up, is that, you know, it usually helps that pass rush because as a quarterback, you're looking at it, okay, they're in zone and then you see they're matching up, and it's just get that extra count to wait for your guy to get the proper leverage or for you to get rid of the football, and that helps that pass rush. And, you know, with Kansas City, that could be – that's the one thing you kind of look at at their offense is they're going to be missing some offensive linemen. How do you think that's going to affect them, missing a couple of bodies on that line? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think Patrick Mahomes is going to have to play the best game he's ever played to win. Uh, like, we're talking about playing against a top five defense that plays alongside a top five offense with five backup offensive linemen. You know, and so that's just so difficult. Now, Patrick is so special when it comes to navigating the pocket and making plays outside. Um, I, they're, they're, they run more RPOs, the run pass option, than anybody in football. So I don't think that's going to change. The big thing is, is really how Patrick navigates it early on or handles it early on. You know, always, I used to always hear coaches, Gary Kubiak was one of them, playing, you know, against a really good defensive line. And when you're beat up, the big thing is to set the tempo early. Ball's got to come out quickly. Do not give that defensive line, like, some juice. Do not let them feel like, okay, this is our game. I think that's the best way to counter it uh, against, you know, a defensive line that's obviously going to go into this game thinking, all right, we're, we could be the reason we win. Dan, is there any way, and all eyes are going to be on Mahomes, but we're talking about these deficiencies for them on the offensive line, right? Eric Fisher out now with the Achilles. Mitchell Swartz has been out for a while now. The interior was already kind of the weakness is this of this Chiefs offensive line. Is there any way they take some pressure off that O-line by maybe running the football a little more with Edwards Alaire and Williams? Like, Do you think that's going to be a big part of the game plan at all? Yeah, I mean, listen, their run game is always up, guys, and you know this, Gabe, like, because they run so many RPOs. Now, the thing that they do is they teach Patrick to lean heavy on the pass. You know, like that RPO decision, that run-pass option that happens at the same time, they just give him the, the belief or the thought process, be aggressive to the throw. Now, maybe they go into it seeing being aggressive to, to the run, being aggressive to handing it off. You know, and then you're looking at Tampa's defense, and part of it is going to be how they want to play the RPO. You know, the – the thought process of slow to go, you know, and force the handoff. The only challenge is this is a really good run stopping unit, especially with Vita Bay back, you know? And so, yeah, my football brain tells me, yeah, you try to try to help them out and slow it down with the run. But I don't know, like at some point you also got to do what you do well. And I would say this, if they are going to lean on the run, if I was Andy Reid and Eric ben and Mike Kafka and they were going to lean on the run, that ball is going sideline to sideline. I'm, I'm trying to – and that's something that they love to do as well, but I'm stressing the ball to the perimeter. So maybe it's the run game that is, you know, Miko Hardman and Harvey Kittle on a, so many of the jet sweeps rather than pounding the football with a CEH or Le'Veon Bell. Dan, you were – were you working in 06? 05. 05. So – Brady had won, what, two Super Bowls or three Super Bowls your rookie year, and Mm -hmm. he's still still playing now, and you played 12 years in the league. I mean, as Mm -hmm. a quarterback, talk to people like how crazy that really is. Yeah, I mean, I always said that I was never, like, overly impressed with the 22-year-old when I came into the NFL or the 24-year-old that was – Six foot three, 250 pounds, you know, dunked, you know, 360 windmill, four, four, like those guys, like, yeah, but there's a lot of those guys, especially when you come into the league. And then as I got older, I was more and more impressed with like the 28 year old that still did that. And then the 32 year old that still moves a little bit like that. And then the 35 year old that still did that. I think the most impressive thing with Tom Brady is that he made this conscious decision in many ways took a leap of faith, like this blind leap of faith, I don't know, 20 years ago, that he was going to put at the very top of, you know, the decision-making list of his life to be the greatest football player ever. And every decision kind of went through that filter, that every decision in his life was about, well, does that do any good to me for me to become the greatest ever? Whether it was how he ate, how he partied, how he traveled, how he vacationed, where he lived, how he trained, like everything was under that umbrella. And, you know, you had no guarantee that it was going to work. You had no guarantee that it was going to pay off. And I think what we see every day with Tom now is he's reaping the benefits of the decisions he made when he was 23 and 24 and 25 and, you know, and so on. And and while he slowed down the, like, the father time aspect, he also bought into the thought process of, I can, you know, we hear that cliche term in football or in sports, get 1% better today. And you're always, sometimes you're like, dude, shut up. Like, I don't even know what that means. And I think Tom Brady's like the walking billboard for it. Like, he has gotten 
just incrementally, incrementally, just slightly better every year at the finer things, the mechanics, the eyes, the feet, the arm, the, the throwing motion. Um, those things over the course of two decades have built up so well. That's why he's able to play at the level that he does for his age. Dan, you look at this Tampa Bay offense. They've got the weapons in the passing game, right? With Godwin, Evans, uh, Gronk, Bray. Then they've got running backs that are playing really well. You look at how Leonard Fournette has played in the playoffs. And then, of course, Ronald Jones when he's healthy. like he, He's an absolute stud. So how do you think Spagnolo and this Kansas City defense are going to attack that offense from Tampa Bay? What, what do you think the strategy will be there? Yeah, I think it'll be attack everybody but Tom Brady. And Gabe, you know this, like oftentimes when we talk about football, we talk about pressure, you know, going after, we often correlate it to just defense and quarterback. You know, I think Spags is going to sit back and ask himself, all right, can I confuse Tom Brady? Like, can I get Tom Brady to not know what we're doing? No. The answer is no. Not, Not over four quarters, for sure as heck not. But can I confuse the offensive line? Can I get the offensive line to communicate poorly or execute poorly on the fly? Can I confuse the wide receivers? Who's the hot guy? Who's got the hot route? What is the hot route? Who am I running it off of? Can I confuse the backs? You know, the backs with having to scan protections or who, what guy do they have to block? And I think that's what Spags will do. He's not going to try to confuse Tom. That's a waste of time. But you can confuse those guys up front. You can, I would go, this. I did a tape on NFL Live yesterday. I think he's going to go after the tailbacks in protection. I think he's going to go after Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones. If you go back to week 12, they got exposed in protection. It showed up in the NFC title game as well when one of those Brady kind of lobbed up picks. And so I think Spags is going to go after that offense, not try to confuse Brady, but confuse everybody else. Uh, they got to be really smart with how they do it. You know, they got to make sure that Breland is covering Mike Evans because the size thing, but that's who they are. I think they're going to go to Ron Matthew. You're going to be near the football all the time, and they're going to unleash him on protection. And he's just so smart and versatile and difficult to block. I think the backs picking up pressures for Tampa Bay are any huge, huge storyline. One of the things that I I think is is really interesting about this game is, you know, whenever you evaluate a game, you always look for, like, where are the advantages and – You know, we've got two obviously equally matched or or close to equally matched quarterbacks and and offenses. And I I think even defensively, they're they're pretty similar. And, you know, typically we'd say, well, Tampa Bay, they're playing in their home stadium. That's a big advantage. But it's crazy that this year they're not going to get fans there or not very many of them anyway. So it's it's really difficult in this game to find, like, what's the X factor? Like, Weather is supposed to be nice. Like everything is like setting up for like a really even football game. Where are you looking to find that X factor? Like what's the difference maker going to be? Yeah, I think, I think I've got like a little bit of each one for or one for each team. Um, you know, I think for Tampa Bay defensively going against Kansas City's offense, they have to go into thinking they're not going to win the game just because they slow down Tyreek Hill, but they will lose it if they don't. You know, I'd say I think the X factor is mm-hmm. how little explosive plays they give up to Tyreek Hill. Um, that is a huge part of their offense. And if you do it, it gives you a chance to win. If you don't, you ain't got no shot. Uh, and then I think for Kansas City's defense going against Tampa Bay's offense is uh, the pressure package. You know, again, you go back to week 12, the first – three third downs in that game for Tampa Bay were third and two, third and three, third and four. They threw out of the first three. They threw on all three of those first three third downs. They went 0 for 3 on them because they didn't have hot answers. And so I just think, you know, how well they communicate pre but the blitz is and then how well they execute their plan post-snap is a big part. So, Dan, something that's been said for a long time with people watching Brady, and, and it's true for all quarterbacks, right, that pressure right in his face, you know, not, not necessarily bringing extra guys to add pressure, but, you know, pressure up the middle bothers him. So I, I look at this game, and, you know, of course, Mahomes is the most important guy for the Chiefs, but the, the next 
next most important guy in my mind might be Chris Jones. I, I feel like he has to have a huge game for Kansas City because I, I think he's single-handedly, even though that Tampa Bay O-line is really, really good, I think he can single-handedly alter the game, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that if I'm watching the game and trying, okay, because I don't think Kansas City is good enough to just put four guys across the line of scrimmage and go win. I just don't think they can rush – Tampa's offense line is so good. You know that. And so I think the really interesting thing will be how many different times can they get Chris Jones over the right guard, the guy who's the backup that's replacing um, Joe Haig, I think, or the injured, the injured right guard for them. How many different times can they get him over the right guard but also simulate the pressure away from Chris Jones so they can't send bodies to him, right? You know, does that make sense? Like how many different ways can they get Chris – really on the backup offensive lineman for Tampa in as, as close to a one-on-one -on -one situation as possible. And yeah. that's why you've got you've to be super creative with how they do it. That's, and if, Chris, if, if, if he has a dominant game in the aspect, that goes a long way. But I just don't think this is – you know, I rewatched the 2007 Super Bowl when it was the Giants and the Patriots, and that's when Steve Spagnuolo, the de 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 defensive coordinator for Kansas City, was the D.C. for the Giants. And – the thing that stood out was like Justin Tucker was out of his mind, but they only brought four, you know, and I, I don't think Kansas City can do that. Take us through what you're doing. I mean, I imagine you've got a full day, full weekend, a, a full week of uh, media hits, TV shows. What's it looking like for you? Is it the busiest you've ever been? Yeah, you know what? Like, the busiest is right in the heart of college football and NFL season, Teddy. You know, because, like, you know, I'm calling college games on the weekend, which is a handful, and then obviously it's seven days a week in NFL. Now that college has been over, and, you know, during the week, uh, again, with during the NFL and college season, I have to watch about 20 to 22 games, you know, Monday through Friday to get all of my work done and get ready to call a college game. As you get into the playoffs, it's like, oh, you got to watch – those six games or eight games and then it's you watch four or five and so it's actually got a little bit quieter and calmer for my life but this week yeah I mean I'm actually heading to Tampa right now I'm in the car heading down there now and uh, tomorrow and Friday we're down there for NFL Live it'll be crazy busy but what an awesome experience to be a part of kind of covering the game down there and so it's been a busy year it's been an awesome year um, but we're kind of winding towards the end of it now. Okay be, before we talk about a couple other things Dan who, who do you like? Who do you like in Super Bowl 55? Uh, I, I know either way, like if, if you go with the Bucks, then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm picking against Mahomes. What am I doing? And if you go with the Chiefs, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm picking against Brady in the Super Bowl. What am I doing? So where do you kind of see it? Yeah, th that's why for me, like I got to look at the better team. Uh, I got to look at the team that I think is best coach. Uh, and that's why it's Kansas City. Uh, Mahomes is out of this world, right? Like I get all that, but I think they're just, they're so difficult to match up against. Um, and you can slow them down for a little bit, but eventually they're just so talented offensively. I don't think any they have. I don't think can, uh, Tampa Bay's defense has somebody that can go punch for punch with Kelsey and punch for punch for Tyreek Hill. I also think the Kansas City defense is way better than people think. Like some people talk about Kansas City's defense like they're a bunch of bums, and I just disagree with it. I just agree with that thought process, and so I think Kansas City. For reasons outside of Patrick, but he is obviously the finisher. Um, talk some OU guys. What would you think of the season uh, Baker Mayfield had there at Cleveland? I mean, it looked like early in the year that it was going to be a rough one, but, you know, they just kind of kept getting better and better. Stefanski, you know, really got a good feel for Baker, what he can and can't do, and called a really good yeah. offense accordingly. So it, it looks like uh, the future is looking bright there in Cleveland. Yeah, you know, Baker's a guy that I've had his back and had his back and had his back, and I was getting a little sour on him, you know, throughout the uh, throughout the first month of the season. I was sitting here like, hey, I keep sticking my neck out for you, bro, and I know you're better than this. And I <laughs> I think that Baker Baker was like the, like the really good example that, you know, myself in this included a lot of us lost sight of the reality of no off season, no OTAs and really truncated training camp, no preseason games. And we analyzed uh, football this year as we have for all years. And this wasn't all years for players. And I think that first month of the season for Baker was OTAs and preseason games. And once he really,
really got comfortable and they got comfortable as an offense, they took off and he played outstanding football. I um, made me some money in a bar with Mar- bet with Marcus Spears, which I loved. So, you know, I, I think that the the two biggest questions for that organization were who's our head coach and who's our quarterback, uh, and they were answered. And I think Baker Mayfield absolutely answered like, hey, can you mature? Yes. Can you be the franchise quarterback? Yes. And that's such an awesome experience, or feeling, I'm sure, for Browns fans. Dan, well, what did you think of Kyler Murray's year? I mean, you look, he just named MVP of the Pro Bowl, whatever that even means now. But uh, kind of up and down there for the Arizona Cardinals. Everyone thought that uh, they were going to be a playoff team. Then it, it just kind of fell apart for them in the back half of the year. What did you think of what Kyler did and kind of how Cliff led that organization as the head coach? Yeah, I, I think my answer is tied to Cliff a little bit. You know, you mentioned up and down. I, I think that was more uh, prevalent in situational football. You know, I think Kyler is so special, and he's going to be a special player for a long time, but he needs to get better when it comes to situational football in the NFL. I thought he took some steps on that this year, you know, getting rid of the football and not taking stupid sacks, understanding that incompletion on first and 10 is better than trying to run around every first and 10 if something's not there. And so I thought he was better with situational football in some areas, but like, you know, second and eight and coach calls the shot play and it's not there. It's not there. Okay. It's just not there. Just move on or third and three. And you've got a ball that can get out of your hands right now. And it may not be what you want, but it's the best chance for the first down. Um, And so I think that. But also Cliff needs to call it better in that regard as well. So, um, still very bright future, um, but they. I, I also think they need to get a little bit better on the perimeter. You know, Larry was okay. Isabella's been okay. Obviously, Hop is amazing. Um, and so uh, they, they just need to get more situ- better at situational football when it comes to NFL terms. Uh, Deshaun Watson, I mean, he wants out of uh, Houston. What do you think's the perfect setup for him, and is this deal going to happen? Is, is, is Houston actually going to move him? It sounds like they may have no choice, and, and he's willing to sit out a year. So what do you think's going to happen with Watson? I mean, here's a guy that I can't blame him right now. He's in the prime of his career. You never know how long it's going to last. Houston really doesn't have any assets, that, you know, draft picks. They've got salary cap problems. What's going to happen with Watson? Yeah, I don't think Deshaun ever plays for the Texans again. Um, this is the same kid that got up there game after game when all of us, myself included, were telling him how bad Bill O'Brien was. And he'd get up there and be like, oh, he's our coach. I love Coach O'Brien. He's the right guy. This isn't about football for Deshaun Watson. This isn't like he's mad that they you know, were disappointing last year. He's playing great and the team's not great and they don't have any dress. This is about Deshaun Watson's soul. Like, this is about Deshaun Watson. There's, there's a line that you just can't cross with guys, right? And it's not an ego thing. This is just like a, uh, you know, like a respect from human to human thing. And I think that's been crossed. And I don't think Deshaun Watson will ever play for Houston again. And I get it, Houston. Like, you know, the, the new coach, a new general manager, they, you weren't there at a part of it. Okay. You know, like, my wife didn't intend to be an at-home teacher this year either, but here she is, you know. And so things change. Um, and I think at the end of the day, Houston's going to have to sit there and go, the reality is he's not going to play. And we've got two teams that have two first-round picks in the NFL draft this year in New York and Miami. While we wanted this guy to win us a championship, he's not going to. So we better go use him to try and go get other players that will. And I think Houston at some point will come to that realization. Okay, Dan, you were one of the first people, right, when you know they started firing everyone there in Detroit to say that the Lions should move on from Stafford, that they should trade him away. And it happened, right? Headed to the LA Rams to play for Sean McVay, uh, getting golf and the picks back. What are your thoughts on that trade? And then how happy are you for Stafford? Because I know you guys are still close. Yeah, I just think it was the right decision for, for the organization. I mean, he was there for 12 years and it didn't work out. And now it didn't not work out because of Matthew. It just didn't work out because a lot of the things out of your your control as a player. It was time to just go, okay, we are completely starting over. 
And so I, I thought that was the right move for the organization. Now, I love the move for the Rams. The Rams are trying to go from good to great. That's just what they're trying to do. They got a two-year window because the way they've structured their organization with some of the picks in the past. And also, like, there's no one in the NFC that we are going to pound the table on and say they're the team to go beat. Like, Green Bay's got some questions with some players. Tampa's got some questions with some players for next year. So the Rams are going, we got a top three defense. We got a great offensive line, an awesome coach, and some really good skill players. Is there a quarterback out there that we think in the next years can put us over the top? Let's make the move. It's worth it. It's worth it. And I also think they were sitting there going, they're going to be in the playoffs the next two years, whether they have Matthew or not. That's the 24, 25, 26 pick in the draft. Is it worth that pick or is it worth that quarterback? You know, so it makes a ton of sense for me for the Rams. And, you know, for Jared going to Detroit, I think Jared is a lot better than people give him the credit for. It's the opportunity for him to create his own identity away from Sean McVay, as much as I love Sean. Um, and, you know, for Matthew, this now gives him the opportunity to sh- shut everybody up. You know, all the people are like, oh, Matthew Stafford's not any good because he can't win. Um, are the same people that in the same breath tell me Jared Goff stinks, even though in the last three years he's second in the NFL and wins. So um, it's just a chance for him to be around a competent team and really to start making the final push towards the Hall of Fame career. How about Goff in Detroit? I mean, you spent some time in Detroit with Campbell as a player. Uh, he's got some good experience there as an interim head coach down in Miami. Did a good job. The players responded well to him. He's been around some good offenses. You, you think, I mean, that place is so difficult to win and so hard to turn around, but you think he's going to do a good job there? Uh, you know, I, I like, I, I can tell you this, Ted, I like the hire uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I thought that having someone that has a history to that organization was important, that knows the struggle, that knows why it failed, or at least has some insight as to why it failed, uh, that knows the city a little bit, um, that knows like, oh, all right, when I was here, this is the stuff that really was a big part of the reason why we weren't any good. Um, I like that. I, I think th- I said when he got hired, who he brought with him as a staff was going to be paramount. Seems like he's put together a really nice staff. Um, I, I, the biggest challenge for Dan is, is he going to be able to get the players in the locker room to trust coaches again? Not, not just because it's like the knee bite cap thing, all knee cap biting thing, but like those players really, really dislike Matt Patricia, but Matt Patricia was in the, 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 the role of coach. So how does he come in there and get those guys to trust and believe in him while also not doing the same stuff that Matt did, which was like beat him up and kill him and rah, we're going to be the toughest ever when you don't win. So that's the biggest challenge for Dan. I'm pulling for him. I know that. All right. Last one. We'll let you run Dano. What, what's this season of the bachelor looking like? I won't lie, man. I've, I've been slacking. I know, I, I know it's Matt James. I know he played at wake forest. Uh, I, I feel like people are really into this season. I just, I, I just haven't caught many episodes. Like give us the, give us the rundown of what's gone down. Uh, who are your favorites, yeah. your, your biggest complaints. Give me everything. Yeah, so first of all, I really like Matt. I think that um, the thing that I liked about him the most was his first night. You know, he started the night with like a prayer. Uh, Very different, not normally seen on television, certainly not on that series. But that's something for me personally that I really liked. Um, I think it's it's a group of uh, girls that are, you know, as contestants that kind of have a really good – vision of what they're looking for um it, it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of like games being played i guess but there are a handful of like yo that one you got to get away from that one or you got to get away from that one or that one's trying to cause trouble and so there are some there are some troublemakers that he's gonna he's kept his eye out as far as getting rid of a couple of them and he's gonna have to continue to i would say this though the more the, the only complaint is I need a little bit more action. I need a little bit more drama. I need like someone to call someone out and like for stuff to get flipped upside down. Um, but so far it's been really good, man. It's good to know. Yeah. Jack good to know. of all trades. Look at, I mean, the man could the do more everything. You can do. The Teddy. more you can do. Yeah, Dan. Unbelievable. Yeah. 
He, he's an unbelievable man. Uh, really appreciate the time. Go follow Dan on Twitter at Dan Orlovsky seven. You can catch him on NFL essentially from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun comes down. They are, they're working our man to the bone. Dan, I appreciate it, bro. Be well, boys. Great to catch up. I'm so excited for the Super Bowl. Uh, it should be a great game, man. It I really should. Are you going to have offense on both sides? I mean, there's, there's going to be, there's, there's really good players. There's a good mix of players, obviously great quarterbacks. I mean, it's everything you really want. Yeah. I'm pumped. All right. Dan Rolofsky's the best. I, listen, people, he knows he ran out of the back of the end zone. He knows it was a mistake. Leave him alone. He's fantastic at his new job. He's incredible at it. We get it. He ran out of the end zone. It's fine. We're over it. Okay, let's move on to the National College Football Roundup. That's brought to you by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience. There are temperature screenings at all entrances and masks are required for all patrons and employees because your safety is Riverwind's number one priority. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. Oh, man, I forgot to adjust the ad read. Tragedy is struck. One second. Uh Let me pull up the other rundown. Don't worry. I got (laughs) it. I'm leaving all of this in. I'm leaving it in. This is on me. I've made a mistake. Here we go. Oh, man. Riverwind. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. <laughs> I found it. Spades and hearts. February 1st through 13th is their keys to my heart. The more points wildcard members earn in that time, the more entries they get in the drawings on February 13th where they can win cash and bonus play. Oh, and one lucky winner can take home a 2021 Audi A5. What? If you need help finding your way, just visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the one what a great ad read great <laughs> well save. Done. great save okay there's only one thing to talk about in college football news ea sports announced that it is bringing the college football video game back now there, there's there's not exactly a ton of details we don't know when it's going to come back e, ea sports wouldn't even venture a guess but they are working with schools on the licensing to be able to use uniforms, mascots, stadiums, all that stuff, which is big because one of the reasons EA Sports stopped making the game, everyone blames Ed O'Bannon in that lawsuit, but one of the reasons they stopped making the game was schools were starting to get a little flaky on those licensing deals with EA Sports. Now, maybe the lawsuit had something to do with that and they didn't want to end up in a bunch of lawsuits, but it, it's huge that the licensing between the schools and EA sports is happening. But uh, until the NCAA rules on name, image and likeness change, they are going to have to keep the players generic on there, which will be interesting, but those NIL rules are going to change. It's only a matter of time. And Ted, I, I think that's where it gets tricky. Uh, when college players get better name, image, and likeness rights, who's going to negotiate the licensing deal for the college football players with EA Sports? Because with Madden, the NFL NFLPA negotiates the Madden deal for all the NFL players, and then all the NFL players get the same check. You and I, I, I mean, we got our Madden check. It was awesome. You're like, oh, hey, awesome, free money. But how will all of that work for college players? I I feel like I'm getting way ahead of myself. I should just be excited, but that's where my brain goes when this was announced. I was like, okay, who's going to collectively bargain for the players? I mean, it it is a, it's a total mess. Um, I, I don't exactly know how it should be handled. I don't know how it should be. In my opinion, the best way to get around it right away is the money 
for each school goes to the school like that you know they whatever ne they negotiate for their their you know uh stadium all of that stuff their emblem all that stuff whatever they negotiate and what percentage they get should go into a fund and they play the, they pay the players after they graduate or are no longer uh playing and that way you can kind of defer that until it wouldn't be a conflict of amateurism. That's the only way I think that they could do it right away. But I, I, I mean, there's 130 division one schools. There's 32 NFL teams. There's 10 times as many players in college football almost than there is in the NFL. And that number is, it just continues. There's new guys every single year. I, I don't know how much they would get, but it's not going to be very much. It'd be the most expensive video game ever made if they start trying to, to pay these guys out a decent amount. I mean, I'd love for it to get it done. And here's the thing, man. I think the players would like for it to get done. Like, even if it meant, like, they all get a free game or something like that, you know, I, I think the – because I know that they had it – the last year was 14, so they had it whenever you played. I mean, didn't the guys love playing and playing with their own team and playing with, uh, you know, all of that stuff, playing with their own, uh, you know, likeness out there? So, I don't know. I bet if you pulled the players, they would want it to come back. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And I, I was actually on – the last version of the game they made, right? They gave me way too big of arms and way too terrible of a hairline, just absolutely ridiculous and disrespectful. But I, I was actually part of that settlement, right? When it got stopped. And it's funny, I was I, I looked it up and I was on the I was on the game four years in a row uh, as a four year starter. And I actually got like 3,600 bucks from that settlement. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. I was like, this is, it was free money. So I got some, they did like a, it had to have been like, it had to have been like 2012 or 13. They did some type of like legends deal on one of the games. And I guess I was on there and they, I got, I mean, it wasn't very much money at all, but I got something for that. I don't even remember what it was, but that was like 2012 or 2013, I think. Yeah, but it's awesome that they're bringing it back because it, it was one of the most popular games. Like, I, I, I remember being absolutely shocked when they said they weren't going to keep making it, and we were all pissed off. I, I think everyone was because I think you're right. I, I think – I think players would probably say, yeah, use my name, image, and likeness. Just give me a couple of free copies of the game or yeah. maybe even one. I, I don't know if one would be enough, but DNCA clearly doesn't want college football players forming a union because they, the, the NCA will break apart before they say the players are employees like that. that that's just how this thing is going to work for eternity. But then you have the whole component where, Congress is going to get involved in, and it seems likely, right? I think Florida's law uh, goes into effect like July 1st or something like that. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's still exciting. And someone was asking me like, why do you think this is happening? Why now? And my initial thought was, okay, well, a bunch of athletic departments across the country lost a lot of money, right? They, they lost a lot of revenue this year because of the coronavirus. This is a really easy way for athletic departments to make money, right? It, you license everything, you know, your uniforms, the stadium, everything, and you collect a check. Like every dollar matters trying to recoup those revenue shortfalls. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. I, are they going to be able to get through all the roadblocks? I don't know. 
I think it is weird, though, like just to think a little bit more about that question. It is weird if they don't have a time frame and they don't know how it's going to work. Why would they announce it now? I mean, it seems that does seem strange. It was out of nowhere, too. It was like, OK, we're bringing it back. We don't really know when or kind of or how what it's going to look like. Or... We haven't developed the game at all. We're just hiring our team, but like we're coming back, baby. I, I, Little I was stock bump though. I did see that. Ha, no kidding. Uh, how about the GameStop people? I, I haven't kept track of the GameStop people. I don't know how they're doing, but I will say Not this. Good. <laughs> there, there's very few things, right? that we agree on that everyone can agree on now. Right. It, it, it feels like there's a lot of polarizing topics. This topic was maybe not 100% because there was some loser Senator that was like, this is an injustice or something. I was like, shut up, man. But everyone was excited when this got announced. Everyone. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> This does not qualify as an injustice. Whenever the the people that are, you know, being exploited love it and would most likely want it to happen. I mean, give me a waiver. Let me let me make the decision on my own if I want to be on the NCAA football game or not. You know, I mean, let's not act like we're gonna uh, get any you know twenty year old kid rich because. He's a little bitty figure running around on a video game. Okay, that that's that's not going to happen. Yeah, it's awesome. It's coming back. I, I have no idea when it's going to be back, but I'm excited. Okay, one more thing for college football news. So Vince Young has been hired as a special assistant to Texas's athletic program. So he's going to get paid to be. Uh, I think he's getting paid to be himself. Uh, that's that's kind of sounds sounds like what the job is there. Now, hopefully this time he'll show up on time. Now, I've talked to Vince about this. I've had him on my serious show. I've talked to him about this be- before, and he, he knows he messed up the last opportunity. But uh, I'm hoping this one goes well for him. Also, Arizona announced that Teddy Bruschi will be a senior advisor to Jed Fish where he will serve on the executive football management team and will consult the football staff in helping fundraising and alumni relations. Now, I love when programs embrace former players like this, Teddy. The only question is, how do we get you this gig at OU? Because you, this (laughs) sounds like it is perfect for you. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know that it's perfect for me, but it does sound like a dream job, doesn't it? Just kind of uh, just kind of be around and, and be available. I mean, I will disagree with one point that you made, though. You said that Vin- Vince Young has been hired and going to be paid to be himself. That's not true. He just has to show up on time. That means they're paying him to be someone else that actually does show up on time. That's not wow. Vince, okay? That's not Vince. Wow. All right? He he had the cush gig before and couldn't show up. No, I mean, hey, I'm happy for him. That's what happens when you win the Heisman Trophy, right? You just have to be around. That's great. That's what every college football player uh, hopes to have someday is, is a job where they're just there. Yeah, he was... Uh... He's a pretty good, pretty good player. All right, let's move on to our winners and losers of the week. And Teddy's winners and losers are brought to you by Advanced Weight Loss Clinic at Sand Springs. They'll help you execute a realistic and achievable weight loss plan designed for you and only you. They've got all kinds of treatments for men and women. They're licensed and trained experts combine diet and exercise with hormone therapies to maximize your results. If you're struggling with low libido or low energy, Advanced Weight Loss Clinic at Sand Springs can help with that too. They also offer Botox and fillers. To get on the path to losing weight, call 918-241-LOSE or visit their Facebook page. If you mention the podcast, you will get a free fat burner injection. All right. Who do you have as your winner of the week, Ted? Well, I wanted to go with Nick Saban after that Zoom uh, was leaked of him giving that recruiting spiel to that kid because, hey, it's simple. It's to the point, but it's a whole lot of truth, right? No doubt. Um, What if that was Kamara Wheaton that leaked that out? Uh, You know, I mean, 
That'd be a good saga grows. Start off your your time there, Alabama. Thought about going with Saban, but this may seem strange, but I went with the Kansas City Chiefs barber who tested positive for coronavirus. You're right. That does seem strange. Well, here's the thing. He's lucky and he's a winner that they caught it because can you imagine if he gave 20 players the coronavirus and was either the reason that the game was postponed for two weeks or was the reason that the Kansas City Chiefs had multiple guys out and lost the game. You remember what happened to the guy at Wrigley, right? That that Bartman? grabbed the foul ball. Yeah. They this ruined his been life. The, it would have been the same story on a much more massive scale for this guy. So the fact that they found it and pulled him out of there before he infected the whole team is the greatest thing that ever happened to this guy. How, how does the guy get in the building without a negative result? That's my question. How, how, There's, how I mean, you are kind of playing a big game soon, right? I mean, I mean, how that that's my question. It's like, way. Adam Schefter's tweeting about it. Like credit to the chiefs for pulling him from the chair mid cut when they got his result. I'm like credit to the chiefs. How in the hell did you not know the guy had the coronavirus? Like, he, Oh, I'm sure you're fine. Go ahead and start cutting hair. We'll test you. You get started. I'm sure you'll be negative. We'll, we'll, <laughs> you know, we'll come give you the green light or we'll come kill you. If you test positive, you don't look sick. Go ahead. Jump on in there and start I mean, cutting hair. Uh, and honestly, it with all of these protocols the NFL's got this year, how the hell does that happen? On this week, I mean. They're playing at the Super a, Bowl on Sunday. Not even a preseason week. <laughs> the week of the Super Bowl. It's like Can these, you imagine if like 20 guys for the Chiefs tested positive and they traced it back to this poor bastard? I mean, he would have he would have been killed on the spot. Meanwhile, we've got Tom Brady, who's like avoiding his family for two <laughs> weeks. Like he's by himself and you've got this barber just strolling into the Chiefs facility. Like what is happening? Oh, man. Oh, OK, who do you have as your loser of the week? Uh, this is a frustration point for me. My loser of the week is everyone in the Big 12 except for Oklahoma. This signing day was a disaster for the Big 12, Gabe. A disaster. The highest, Oklahoma obviously ended up number 11. We talked about their average recruit ranking, which has them more like a, a, a fifth or sixth ranked team, but they only did have the 16 signees. Texas is the next highest at 17. And then you've got to go all the way to Oklahoma State, I believe, at 39. West Virginia at 40, Baylor at 44. That is embarrassing for the Big 12. I mean, obviously, the SEC has multiple teams in the top 10. Uh, the Big 10 has uh, multiple teams in the top 10. The ACC is, is out recruiting us. Notre Dame out recruiting our conference. It's an embarrassment. You know who has a top 20 class? Nebraska. Nebraska has a top 20 class. Maryland has a top 20 class. Ole Miss has a top 20 class. I mean, it, it, Iowa, Arkansas, these are top 25 classes. Mississippi State, after the disaster year they had under Mike Leach, has a top 25 class. But the Big 12, all they can muster is Oklahoma and Texas. There's a reason that Oklahoma is talked about the way they are nationally and aren't given a whole lot of credit for winning six straight Big 12 championships is because there's not any talent in this league. It's sad. I, I really can't disagree with anything you said. Um, you're right. Oklahoma State has the third best recruiting class in the Big 12. They have one four-star kid. One four-star kid. Yeah, that's the thing that there's a lot of four stars. Like it's not like there's not a lot, but yeah, I'm with you. I'd, Boston I'd, College, Boston College 
and Rutgers have a better recruiting class than Oklahoma State. Well, Boston College is also in a lot better recruiting area than Oklahoma State. Well, I, I say that. I, you look at Boston College, they got to recruit a certain type of kid, but – I don't know. Maybe Jeff Halfley's just a hell of a recruiter. Maybe he enjoys recruiting, unlike Mike Gundy. I mean, what about? I mean, you can find a reason for some of these schools, but like Nebraska, I mean, they're awful. I don't know. It's just it's, and maybe even Nebraska finally started paying recruits to try and turn things around. I don't know, but they have a top twenty class. I'm just saying that you know, the Big Twelve. The talent discrepancy is real. It's real. Alabama had more five-star kids in this class, seven, than probably outside of uh, Oklahoma and Texas, that any school, all of the Big 12 combined has ever had in the history of their programs. Right. Yeah. The uh, When you look at the recruiting rankings, and they don't mean everything, but – I think people that say they don't matter are very misguided. Oh, they matter. I mean, they it may not matter. matter between like, you know, 25 and 20 or 35 and 25. But if you're trying to win a national championship, you ain't going to do it from, from outside the top 10, man. It's just, I mean, even Oklahoma, we had a great class, a great class. We've recruited really well over over recent years. Alabama has more five star kids in this class than we've had in the last decade or more. Overall, damn it, <laughs> it's crazy, man. All right, so well, that's depressing. But at least OU is still the best in the conference, that's right? So we can be in a you know a decent mood about it. Here comes number seven, eight, nine, ten of championships in a row. At well, some point, it really starts to kind of look negative on you. you well, know? well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> uh, my winners and losers are brought to you by Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. They know that children need to be in school and are doing everything possible to make that happen. Bishop McGinnis students were welcomed back last August and saw very few interruptions in 2020 with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. If you want to provide the best educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. So for my winner of the week, uh, I I thought about going with, uh, have you seen the story about this 19-year-old in England, uh, Josen Flavel? Flavel? He was hit by a car last March. And has been in a coma for 10 months. So he has no idea, had no idea, woke up, no idea about the coronavirus. He's awake now and sounds like he's recovering well, thank God. But his family is trying to like explain everything to him. But I'm just saying, if you're going to pick 10 months to miss, like he picked a solid stretch, right? I mean. And he's probably going to get a Netflix deal out of that, right? He's got to. I mean, talk about an interesting couple of days of catch up. I mean, amazing. I mean, I, tell me more. I mean, that, wouldn't you just I'll be send sitting you the there article. like, it's like, I'm eating this up. Keep telling me what's been going on, guys. This is crazy. It's like you're uh, explaining a, a a movie plot to me. No, that's that's amazing. Yeah, it, it was nuts, but I, I also thought about going with OU basketball, right? Jump 15 spots, number nine in the AP poll, largest one-week jump in program history, and then they went and lost to Texas Tech in Lubbock in what can only be described as a rock fight. <laughs> but my winner of the week, you you brought it up. It, it's Nick Saban in Alabama. I... I mean, I've looked at all kinds of different recruiting sites and a lot of people say that they just locked up the number one recruiting class of the year and the number one recruiting class of all time, the best recruiting class ever. Some are saying that this is according to CBS sports, Ted, Alabama's recruiting class has 16 of the top 91 players in the country. 
They have seven five stars in their recruiting class. Just on offense, they sign the top two offensive tackles, the number two guard, the number one center, and four of the top 10 wide receivers. And they added Kamar Wheaton today, who is the number two back. It's, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Nick Saban, he loses coaches, he loses players, and and he just reloads. I'm not sure. It's hard to... It's hard to really enjoy greatness sometimes in the moment, right? Like sometimes you get, it's kind of like LeBron James. I I don't know if we all appreciate how good LeBron James is and just how insane what he's doing right now at his age. Like, I I don't know if we really appreciate enough because we're in it. What Nick Saban's doing at Alabama is unbelievable. It will never be done again ever and it's remarkable man it's it's crazy and that train is just going to keep rolling i'll tell you what's amazing you know five stars are they're not guarantees but you know it's it's a it's a pretty good indication of of what type of player a kid's going to be in college now Here's what's interesting, you know, when you start digging into like five stars, five stars don't work out everywhere. There's a bunch of five star kids that you've never heard of that never even play wherever they go. And it just, it just doesn't turn out to really be anything. If you go to Alabama's page and look at their, like their highest ranked recruits all time, it's like, it's the who's who of solid players in the NFL. and a lot of it's offensive line, a lot of it's wide receivers. I mean, their hit on five stars has to be better than anyone else's by a huge margin. And the reason I think it is, is because of the structure of his program. And, you know, whenever you're a highly recruited kid and everyone's telling you how great you are, you know, for three years, whenever you're in high school and that you're going to go straight to the pros and you're going to leave early and, You'll be a top 10 pick. There's there's a, a, a large amount of ego that starts to build up. And it's not really these kids' fault. I mean, it's it's all the, the hangers on that are telling them how great they are. But when you go to Alabama, it's back of the pack, and you get no special treatment. And there's a solid discipline structure that is details, details, details. And it turns those kids into good players, and it turns them into good pros. There's no doubt. I will say honorary uh, winner of the week, Oklahoma City Thunder just destroyed the Houston Rockets. Uh, I've been watching the game while we the were Rockets recording. The Rockets were hot right now too, right? Uh, Rockets were hot, and uh, SGA didn't play. Dort left with some knee soreness early in the game, and Basley drops 18. How about Kenrich Williams? 19 points coming off the bench i mean let's go let's go thunder okay let's my go, loser but lose that game next time guys but next on. time lose maybe you know once again <laughs> i can't i can't cheer for them to lose but okay my loser of the week uh i thought about going with punk satani phil because stupid groundhog saw a shadow so everyone hates him for seeing his shadow because now there's going to be six more weeks of winter also Loser of the week, people that haven't seen Groundhog Day and they still make Groundhog Day references, even though they don't know what it's from. Uh, the, those people, that's got to be a rough way to live life. But my loser of the week, it's me or OU fans or both or however you want to put it. Because, Ted, I've got bad news. Very, very bad news. I interviewed Steve Zarkeesian for the first time today on my Sirius XM show. And he is awesome. Oh, no. He's cool. He's down to earth. Listen, he stayed on through a commercial break on the Zoom with us, talked to us for the whole break, and then we kept doing the interview. He gave us like 22 straight minutes. That doesn't happen. And he talked about his offense. 
I got to talk some offensive philosophy with him. Talked about getting athletes in space. Like everything I believe in. We talked about run game in the break. Like he was fantastic. I I I was torn at the end of it because I was like, I think I like Steve Sarkeesian. This is not good. But the reason I'm the loser of the week or OU fans or whatever, Texas is going to be good. I'm telling you right now, if, and, and maybe I'm overreacting to a first impression, but he told me he had never even been to Austin. He said he thought he was going to something similar to Tuscaloosa, that it was just going to be in Texas. And then he got to Austin and he was like, oh, this place is awesome and huge. And there's all kinds of stuff going on. He was like, yeah, I think I'm going to be able to recruit players here. He started talking about Tesla and Apple. Like he already has the Austin spiel, but he's a relatable guy. He's easy to talk to. He's smart. I'm not not worried is the way I'm going to put it. He, yeah, I, I'm concerned. He, he was fantastic. Let me set you at ease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Br- bring me back. Like I'm going to set you at ease. Okay. Thank you. Texas is where good coaches go to be ruined by people that don't know anything about football. Did you ask him why he got vetoed on his Mike Stoops linebacker coach hire? I, I respectfully declined (laughs) asking that question to him. Well, that's the real thing though. I agree with everything that you said. I think like, I really loved watching his offense. We talked about shoes during the commercial break and food. He was awesome. Shoes, food. I mean, he's he loves sneakers, guy. by the way. He called himself a sneakerhead. Wow. Well, I, I mean, hey, I got no doubt that he's going to recruit well and he's he's going to put together a really good offense. I don't know if he's going to find a quarterback, but it, it, that's not the problem. The problem is the shark infested waters that everyone wants to have some type of control over the program. We've already seen it. So I know, I know just I've fallen victim to it myself before Gabe. I've done this myself. I'm just, I'm telling but he's you he's so right much now, cooler than Tom it. Herman. He's That's so true. much well, cooler. Tom Herman sets the bar incredibly low. I mean, they should have fired Tom Herman when they sh- saw him sling, uh, swing that sledgehammer at that locker. That's a good should point. Should have been over right then. Uh, you, you mentioned the quarterback situation. He had a good answer for that too. And which once again, the the whole time I'm listening when, you know, Holly and I are interviewing him, I'm going, Oh man, this guy's good. Oh, he's good. <laughs> she, she asked him about the quarterback situation and he looked at both of us on the zoom. He goes, do you really think I'd take a job where I didn't think we had a really good quarterback or a couple of really good options on the roster? And I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. You should have said, well, yeah, I mean, they offered you a ton of money. I'd take six and a half million dollars and coach, you know, Wyoming. So yeah, I think you would. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, OU Texas, we, you, you mentioned how poorly the rest of the conference recruited this year. OU in Texas is going to get back to being how it was when you were playing. Are First you, round are picks you, everywhere. Are you picking, what do you pick in Texas to finish next year in the conference? Second or third? Second or third ahead of ISU, maybe? Possibly. Dude, I'm telling you, this is like the best first impression I've ever gotten from a coach. Okay. He was, he was, I'm, you can tell it, it's tearing me up inside. It's tearing me up mm. inside. I was like, I was like, this guy is fantastic. I don't know, but we'll revisit that. We'll revisit okay. that. We're Man, he's going to, B. John Robinson is going to be a monster in his system. Well, hey, he's going to actually hand him the football. How about that? Huh? I know. Crazy. Huh? Amazing. Okay, let's finish up and let's wet the beak. That's brought to you by Sound Advice. A lot of us are watching our favorite football teams from home this year, which is why you need to get ready for game day with a home theater system from our friends at Sound Advice. Sound Advice can customize your home entertainment system indoors or outdoors. 
sound advice to the Wi-Fi network and all the audio visual at my new house. And it is awesome. They hide all the wires and the cable boxes. So it looks great. And I can control every TV in my house from my phone. And my Wi-Fi has been flawless for the best home theater systems in the Oklahoma City area. Call Sound Advice at 405-549-3880 or visit soundadviceokc.com. Okay, a couple fun Super Bowl props, Ted. Let's start with the national anthem. Mm -hmm. Some places you can find a minute 59, but most places the over-under has been set at two minutes. And it is the first time in 15 years that the national anthem will be a duet. Eric Church and Jasmine Sullivan. The under is the favorite coming in at most places. I, I've seen it a lot at about minus 145. Now, the national anthem hasn't gone over a minute 53 the past three years. You can also bet on if they'll mess up the words or skip words, which is also kind of fun. But what are you feeling over under two minutes? I'm feeling the over. Really? When there's two, well, when there's two people, don't you feel like there's going to be an urge to make sure that each one of them has the ability to show their stuff a little bit? Yeah. I, I mean, I, that's kind but of Eric why Church, I would go over. It, it's not like he's a flashy performer right and That's i say true. that i mean that that is true and the other thing is is he going to be playing a guitar because when does it officially start i would assume the clock doesn't start until first o word. starts okay. and and i believe it ends when the first brave ends like there there's been some double triple braves <laughs> brave, and i believe brave, it's the first brave. brave yeah okay i mean i'd still go over just because i think with the duet they're going to play it up a little bit but here's the thing i would bet that they do not mess up the words because it's a lot easier and and comfortable to sing with someone else it's a good it point. It doesn't seem like you get nearly as lost as much uh, whenever you sing with someone else, like I would ever know, like I've ever sang anything. But I feel like that would be the case a little I bit. I think I've it's sang not with an you. Easy song to sing. It's it's really not. Pretty sure I've sang with you at a karaoke bar or a karaoke setup in what was that? The Orange Bowl. That was fun. That was fun. That was fun. Plank. I think Plank. we did a duet of our own. Plank's a bad. Plank's a, he's a bad man. Old Plankster. Okay, uh, another one, coin toss. Uh, both heads and tails have the same odds. Uh, minus 105. Interesting little nugget here for you, Ted. It's been tails in six of the last seven Super Bowls. And the team that has won the toss has lost the last six Super Bowls, hmm. which seems impossible, but... It's what the website I got this from said. So if that's wrong, blame this website. But what do you think? Heads, are you a heads or tails, guys? That's that. Tails. That's what it comes down to. Tails. 100%. Tails never fails. And just because I know there's the people out there that say, well, six of the last seven, it's due for heads. No, it's not due for heads. It's not. It's tails. It's going to be tails. That's what you always go with. I don't care if it said that the last 55 coin tosses have all been tails i would still pick tails yeah i'm taking tails also I, I i can live with it you just you you go with what you know and you live with it well one last prop the weekend is doing the halftime show you you a weekend fan sure yeah i like some of his songs yeah good voice good voice on that guy now there's some fun props like how many outfits he will wear and all that stuff but i, I thought this one was pretty funny he's canadian right? You can bet on whether or not he'll mention Canada plus 400 that he will mention Canada. I, I mean, the odds I like, I, I like, but will the weekend mention Canada? Yes. I mean, you know, this look, people from Canada, like big performers, well-known people. Like, I don't know if it's because they come from a, a country that has a much smaller population than the U.S., but they 
it's almost like they're pressured into they have to remind everyone from Canada for the people back home, you know, so Ooh, that was good. I, I think he will for sure. <laughs> back home. Okay, so we got to pick it. I mean, you you can't not pick the Super Bowl, Kansas City favored by three. I'm telling you right now, I I like the Bucks. Uh, I'll take the points or give me the points. If you're giving me points with Tom Brady in the Super Bowl, uh, I, I will gladly go with that side. And Teddy, my main belief in football is that the game is won and lost at the line of scrimmage. I think the Bucks have a better defensive line, and I think the Bucks has uh, they they've got a better offensive line. I I know I'm going to be feeling like an idiot for picking against Patrick Mahomes, but I'm going with the Bucks because I think they're better at the line of scrimmage, and I feel terrible about it. I don't like it at all, but I can't. I just can't escape it. Uh, I think they're better up front. There's no reason to feel terrible about that pick. It's the correct pick. <gasps> not, not only do I take the Bucks um, and the points, I, I think they win the football game outright. Money line it? I Man, I just feel like whenever there's a story, whenever there's something like this, I mean – Kansas City, they won the Super Bowl last year, obviously. They've been the favorite ever since. It's just a throwaway statement that they're going to win this one and they're going to win the next 10 with Mahomes there. Like The energy you get from having never been close to all of a sudden being there, it's, just, it's captivating. And I feel like that locker room, that that team is going to be motivated out of their mind for this football game. And I know Kansas city won it last year, but they've got the edge at quarterback because Brady has been here a million times. Everyone knows that and everyone on that team trusts his lead and what he says about this game and how to approach it and, and how you win it and what you've got to do. I mean, he, there's good players on that team, but the difference this year with them has been Tom Brady. They've bought in to whatever it is he's he's brought down there with him, his method, his, his the way that he uh, you know approaches the game and approaches the the game week. So I'm going Tampa Bay. Now you're right; it could be the dumbest pick of all time, as good as Mahomes and the Mahomes and the Chiefs are. But you know, skill position wise, when you bring in everything. I mean, it's close. Ah, it's close, especially depending on how healthy Antonio Brown is. I mean, they may, may be edge Tampa Bay. Yeah, just it, it, it's hard. Like, like what is Tyreek Hill's worth, right? And, and then you talk about Kelsey. You know, they do have Gronk and Braid. Like both those guys are really, really good, but neither of them are. Travis Kelsey, what he can do when it comes to but, just controlling the middle of the like, field in the passing game. But Tyreek Hill and Kelsey are fantastic. But whenever you start clipping off Mike Evans, Godwin, Antonio Brown. Oh, yeah. If you're talking Scottie about the, Miller, Gronk, yeah. the backfield, I mean, it, the skill Bucks position, are going to win. Bucks the are going to win. position edge is to the Bucks, in my opinion. I know that sounds crazy, but. My one bold prediction. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be an interception or a forced fumble, but Devin White is going to have a huge, like game altering play in the Super Bowl. That's my prediction. Devin White. I don't know what it's going to be, but he's a beast, dude. He's a monster, that, bro. Those two inside backers are the mo the least talked about guys. Uh, they are so good. Levante David and Dev, they are. I mean, you got the young, extremely athletic guy that could just bring it. And you got Levante David that's been there forever, is just a, a pure vet, has a great understanding of the game and their defense. I mean, those two guys are great. Super Bowl Sunday. Let's go. I know what Dr. Fauci said. 
Everyone be smart with their Super Bowl parties. Only Take care stop of each other. And clap. No cheering or chanting. I think someone said you're supposed to stomp instead. Yeah. Like instead of screaming, the CDC wants us to stomp. Is that yeah, true? Stomp and, stomp and clap. No chanting or cheering. Right. Okay. <laughs> and no, no alcohol because you're less likely to follow protocols if you drink alcohol, which fact check true. <laughs> that's, that's definitely <laughs> That, that that's a scientific fact right there. All right, everybody enjoy your Super Bowl Sunday episode 83 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Monday morning. Orlando Brown Jr. got to be with us. Big guy from the Ravens. Let's go. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on Sports Team Sports Team. That's not it. Sports mm-hmm. Talk 1400. I see I could I I combined talk and 14 and made it team. So Just sports talk. Skip through it. That's perfect. It makes it quicker. I like that. I may start doing it. And you can hear me from three to five on Sirius XM, Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great weekend. Till next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.